Hey guys, it's early morning, um, probably around 7 a.m. right now, and um, trying to get some breakfast in early because I am nervous. I got that talk today at the Agriculture Society of America over here at the Double Tree in uh, Hilton in Tampa, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm nervous. I'm nervous about today, but I'm excited. I'm excited to go out there and meet a whole bunch of new people that I've seen online, but I've never met in person, so. I'm happy about that. I'm just nervous about my speech. So hopefully everything goes well. Um, let's see what happens. By the way, if you guys notice that I take any long pauses during the talk, don't worry, I'm not lost. It's just that Sarah said I have to be up here for 45 minutes. So <laughs> just enough the time I don't really do that. For those that don't know me, like Duncan said, my name is Rensel Borges, and I've been working with finches for about the last 13 years, mainly African and Australian species. And uh, the subject that I chose for today's talk is establishing wildcat finches in U.S. agriculture. Now, a couple of quick side notes before we begin. When I say wildcat, I am referring to the African species. These are the ones that require our help in order to get established. And another thing, I realize that many of you may work with other species other than finches. You may have parrots, <laughs> softbills, game birds, and so on. But try to be open-minded during the talk. Take what you can and apply it to the species that you're working with. After all, the main focus of this talk is to a certain point inflict a sense of urgency in each and every single one of you with the species that you're working with. Agriculture as a whole is still in its, in, it's in, in its infancy. There are so many species that require our help in order to get established. And believe it or not, one of the best ways at doing this is by studying the past. History has a very funny way of repeating itself. And if we look close enough in between the lines, we can spot small details or patterns that may help us improve our current situation over the future. Now, agriculture over the year has made great progress with the help of science and technology. And it's one of the reasons why we know so much about the species that we keep nowadays. Just think about it. With something as simple as your phone, you can pull it out, ask any question about any species, and within seconds you can have the answer to that question. But in order to continue advancing in this hobby, we're going to need much more than just science and technology. Agriculture is defined as the breeding and rearing of birds, and this is an art. An art that unfortunately is slowly disappearing. So in today's talk, we're going to be traveling back in time to take a look at the history of imports to the U.S., along with some of the things that have impacted it along the way. Like for example, the first diseases, CITES and their three appendixes, the Wild Bird Conservation Act, the different types of bird keepers that we have here in the U.S., how we can establish some of these finches in U.S. agriculture, and finally we'll end with what the future may hold for us. Now starting all the way at the beginning with the history of imports to the U.S., there are records that show the importation of wildcat birds coming in as early as 1901. And since then, steady streams rarely dropping below 300,000 were shown every year, except for a period between 1943 and 1967. And this was about the time when we first started to encounter problems. The very first problems came by way of diseases, and there were parrot fever and exotic Newcastle disease. Now with parrot fever, this was a pandemic that was thought to have started in 1929 while the birds were being transported in ships from South America. But the ban on the species didn't come into effect until 1942. And with exotic Newcastle disease, this one was thought to have started between 1926 and 1942 while the birds were being transported in ships from Java to Europe and South America. Then between 1968 and 1972, this disease had spread to every single continent. And by 1972, it was so far out of control that California had to perform its first test of disease control by eradication on a national basis. Now the fear of having something like this re-enter or something similar to this re-enter resulted in the establishment of the first USDA quarantine facilities in 1974. 1974 was also the year that the U.S. joined CITES. For those that don't know what CITES is, they are the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. And what they do is that they regulate species by placing them in different appendixes, either Appendix 1, 2, or 3. Appendix 1 is for species that are threatened with extinction, Appendix 2 is for species that can at one point or another become threatened, so they're placed here for that protection. And Appendix 3 is for species for which a country is asking protection of that specific species. Now by 1981, only seven short years after the U.S. joined CITES, all parrot species, with the exception of a couple like peach-faced lovebirds, Indian ringnecks, budgies, and parakeets, 
were placed on either CITES Appendix 1 or Appendix 2. And just like that, parrot importations once again completely stopped. But it wasn't bad for all of us. Other bird keepers had a great time during this time. Between 74 and 92, there was an approximately between 300,000 to 900,000 birds imported each year. And 75% of these birds were exotic wildcat birds. There was an endless supply of birds coming in during that time, and that led to an amazing growth during uh, that period of time for the U.S., not only in agriculture, but also avian medicine. But as they say, all good things must come to an end. Now, real quick, before I forget something that I did pass, during this time, one of the reasons why we had so many of these birds come in, especially the finches during the 70s and 80s, was because of the advancements of technology. See, prior to the 60s, the birds that were being imported in came by way of ships. And this made it very difficult for those smaller species to make it in. Now, by the late 60s, we started to incorporate air travel, thanks to the advancements of technology, and this was a game changer for those smaller species. Little by little, they started to flood our market, and more and more people would show interest in them. Then, 1992 comes around, and the Wild Bird Conservation Act gets passed. And for those that don't know what the Wild Bird Conservation Act is, this is an act that was created to promote exotic bird conservation by, one, assisting the country of origins conservation program, two, ensuring that all trade in such species in <coughs> the United States is biologically sustainable and not detrimental, three, limiting or prohibiting imports of wild birds when necessary, and four, encouraging implementation of the conservation on international trade in endangered species of wild fauna and flora. By 1995, only three short years after that was passed, there was barely any African species in the U.S. They had almost all disappeared, with the exception of a few that we would see from time to time, but these were making their way into Canada because they were not under the same regulations as us. But it wasn't a sustainable amount for us to continue, so unfortunately, many of these species were lost during that time. Then 2007 rolls around, and CITES lifts their Appendix 3. Just like that, after 14 years of drought, we start to see a variety of species make their way back into the U.S., like greenback twin spots, dibelskis, blue caps, red cheeks, orange breasts, western blue bills, lavenders. I mean, the list goes on with a variety of species that I could sit here all day and name for you guys. And this was also about the time when I started to show an interest in these species, or when I first noticed these birds. See, prior to this, don't get me wrong, I had worked with a variety of other birds. I had pigeons, conures, some smaller parrots, but I had never kept or had any of these smaller birds. So I was very attracted to them. I remember the very first one that I saw was the red bill fire finch. And this was a small astrodidae finch, bright red in color with a yellow eye ring. During this time, I had just gotten married with my wife as well, and we lived in a small studio apartment. There wasn't much room in this apartment for big cages or an outdoor aviary. So I did the best that I could with the space that I had. And if, if you could imagine it, I built almost like a bookshelf. It was six feet tall, five foot long, three foot wide. It had a glass in the front, uh, artificial shrubs. And I had four species in there, the red-billed fires being one of them. And seeing that process of how those birds, the male, for example, courted the female, the male would start the nest. They would share an incubation duty, then hearing the chicks begging for food and fledging. And all of this was in the one place in that apartment where I could keep it, the only place where I had room, the bedroom. I still have no idea how I got away with that to this day. <laughs> but seeing that process is what made me fall in love with this hobby and get to the point where I am today. Now from 2007 to present day, I have been able to see or witness many species of African imports come in and slowly but surely, they've disappeared. So what causes these birds? Why is it that we are having such a hard time establishing these species in U.S. agriculture? Well, there may be a couple of reasons, but in order to answer that, we'll have to take a look at the different types of bird keepers that we have here in the U.S. And I like to place them into three categories. First, we have the collectors, the exhibitors, and then the breeders. <clears throat> The collectors are usually collect certain species for pleasure. They don't really have an interest in breeding the species that they keep. Most times they have a hard to find species in mixed collections and their goal is to share and show what species they keep on social media. Now I know a lot of breeders that have a hard time liking collectors. And it's usually because these will pick up and buy single pair, single birds or pairs of birds that a breeder may need in order to continue their progress with that species. But believe it or not, Collectors also play a role in agriculture. If we think about it from a modern day view, technology, 
This is one of the best methods to get this hobby advancing forwards. And since collectors spend a lot of their time online showing these birds, it starts to spark an interest in people that otherwise would have never seen this hobby. So that plays a big role in what they do for agriculture. And not only that, but the demand that they have on some of these species keeps the market moving. It's simple economics. I'm willing to say that at the moment, there are probably more collectors than exhibitors and breeders combined. So their demand for these species allows more importers to continue to bring in these birds in to fill that demand. Now moving on to the exhibitors. These are concerned with maintaining standards, certain standards in their birds. Their main goal is to compete with the birds that they keep and breed, and they contribute to aviculture by producing strong, healthy lines. And finally, we have the breeders. Usually the breeders have a specific goal in mind when it comes to the species that they keep. They have multiple bloodlines to ensure successful breeding for future generations. They know that eventually, at one point or another, fresh blood is needed, so small networks are created to swap lines. And regardless of what fuels their motivation to breed, whether that's the need to preserve a species or the greed to profit from them, they contribute to the success of the species that they work with. So now that we know the difference between the different types of keepers, I'll ask again, why after so many years are we having a hard time establishing some of these species? Well, there may be a couple of reasons. Number one, like I mentioned earlier, unfortunately there are more collectors than there are breeders. How can we change this? Well, this may be where the speech gets a little bit culty, but we have to start converting collectors into breeders. But on a serious note, we have to try our best to do or almost emulate what they are doing. We need to use social media in our favor and not only promote clubs like this one where we can come together and meet like-minded individuals, but also to teach others and show others what we know so that they can learn also how to improve or get into this hobby. Many in this hobby start off as collectors until they meet a breeder that sparks that interest in them to start breeding. And guys, I know that sometimes it can be difficult to jump online and do stuff like this because we have to deal with people who have illogical ideas about what we do. We have the ones that think that we should just open the doors of our cages and let the birds fly out and be free without knowing the repercussions of something like this. Or the ones that like to compare our breeding rooms to puppy mills. Or even worse, maybe we meet somebody who starts off in this hobby and they don't agree with the methods of a breeder, yet they have the bird that they have now because of that breeder. So there's a lot of things that we have to go through, but these people are sometimes far and few between and we have to figure out a way to get past that fear and start promoting and teaching what we know to others so that this hobby can continue advancing. Number two is because unfortunately most exhibitors and breeders stick to the easier to breed species and rarely do they challenge themselves to the harder species. And number three is because we lack fear or simply just don't care. We expect or think that all imports will continue to arrive and we completely disregard what history has shown us. It's only a matter of time before import bans and regulations are set in place. Many of the African countries that have allowed export in the past have been shut down due to bird flu outbreaks. In West Africa, one of the largest was Senegal. And just recently, they had to stop due to its first positive bird flu outbreak. This was a major hit to African export due to the number of other countries within Africa that would use Senegal as their point of export. Sierra Leone, Ghana, and Togo are countries that in the past also exported to the U.S. but are currently unable to do so due to the bird flu. Currently, if I'm not mistaken, Guinea and Mali are the only two that are importing. And it's one of the reasons why you may still see some African species make their way into quarantine, like green singers, gray singers, cutthroats, and so on. But even so, it's getting increasingly harder and harder to bring those species in. Between the difficulties of finding direct or daily flights, the issues within these countries that the birds have to go through since they have to go through the Middle East, the Ethiopia, in order to get here because there are no more direct flights, along with volume restrictions and seasonal restrictions implemented by the airlines, and, no, and now these birds are no longer cost-effective for the importers that are bringing them in. Now you're probably wondering, you just mentioned West Africa. What about East Africa, South Africa? It's a big continent. Well, there aren't any much better. They have very similar issues in East Africa. For example, Tanzania, where the blue caps and purple granite ears originate from, they stopped exports years ago in order to preserve their wildlife. And South Africa isn't much better. They also had to stop due to bird flu outbreaks. As you can see, between the effects that the bird flu has had on the continent and self-imposed embargoes on some locations like Tanzania 
getting birds from Africa has become nearly impossible. And the bird flu isn't the only thing that we have to worry about. If you haven't heard about HR 2685, many people didn't hear about this one, but this is the Wild Bird Conservation Reauthorization Act. And this bill was presented around 2019 by Congressman Jeff Van Drew. And what the Wild Bird Conservation Reauthorization Act would do is it would reauthorize for the next five years from 2020 to 2025, the same conservation act that George Bush signed in 1992. And this would stop all African imports. Now, luckily, this bill never came into effect, but people were still affected. In 2020, COVID struck, and although the t this bill was for the time being forgotten, we still saw the effects on our fragile import system. Due to COVID, international flights became affected, and as a result, bringing these birds in began, became harder and harder. Now, have I scared you yet? If I haven't, let's take a look at some of the bird keepers in the past that have been scared and how they have used that fear to save some of the species that they currently work with. And I believe that no one knows this fear better than parrot breeders. It may be one of the reasons to their success establishing certain species. From 1943 to 67, all parrot imports were banned due to parrot fever and Newcastle disease. Then 81, as I mentioned earlier after CITES joined, they classified most of these parrots on either Appendix 1 or Appendix 2. That fear is what sparked the beginning from most parrot species. From 1970 to 1992, most of the available parrots were bred for the first time in captivity. The 80s were one of the best years at achieving first generation. That same fear is what also helped the Europeans establish some of the wild-caught African species that we struggle with now. See, prior to 1992, the U.S. was the number one importer of birds. Then in 1992, after the Wild Bird Conservation Act is signed, Europe becomes the number one importer of birds. From 93 to 2006, they started importing a lot of these birds in, and they were able to successfully establish many of them prior to the bird flu outbreaks of 2006, which stopped their imports from Africa. And they did such a great job at establishing so many of these species that to current date, many of the birds that we receive nowadays come from Europe. So let's assume that you guys are, or someone here is a collector, and you've seen the decline. You want to help, you, you know that now you want to become a breeder and there's something that you can do to offer these birds help. What can you do? How can you start? Well, here are a couple of tips that may help you out. Number one, find a mentor. Breeding is an art. You guys know that saying that says every artist was first an amateur? Well, every collector or every breeder was once a collector. Breeding can be at times very frustrating. It often has more downs than ups, and this can be agonizing for a beginner. So much so that I've seen many start and quit just from frustration. I've always said that most breeders are just one bad season away from becoming collectors themselves. Number two, research the species that you are going to keep and breed. I can't stress how important it is to do something like this. For example, ask yourself questions like, is the species that I'm getting monomorphic? If the species that you're getting is more morphic, remember that you're going to need more than one or two, more a couple of birds. You need to be able to end up with pairs at the end. So you will have to either DNA sex these birds or separate them and start to look for characteristics that may require you to know that one's a male and one's a female to make your pairs. Many people make the mistake of buying just two birds thinking that they're going to end up with a pair and oftentimes end up with two females or two males. And then it may not be as easy to find pairs again because someone else has already purchased the rest of them. Also, will the species be housed together or separate after the breeding season? There are some birds that are better housed together. There are some that only come together during the breeding season. There are some that are colony breeders and so on. So it is very important to do that research on your species. And this was a big problem for me in 2020. During that time, I was able to find six pairs of Bekdolsky twin spots. Now, I knew very little about those birds other than the fact that they were very difficult to find. They had just came in one of the last imports and I had to get my hands on them. So I purchased them right away. As soon as I got them, I took them home, placed them in quarantine, and I knew that they were aggressive to a certain point, but I didn't know quite how aggressive they were. So what I did was I put them by pairs in their quarantine cages. Now, only two days after I brought them home, I found two females dead. And just like that, my chances with that species drastically diminished. So what I did was I acquired the help of a couple of breeders who had worked with that species in the past, did some research, saw the mistake that I had made, quickly corrected. 
Thanks to that, I was able to go on that first year and breed 44 chicks that were first generations from those four pairs that I had left. Another question that you should ask yourself is, will you offer live food? If not, do you know your alternatives? Most of these finches are very <laughs> insectivorous. They rely on uh, large amounts of live foods in order to successfully rear their chicks, not only in the wild, but this also extends over to when we bring them into captivity. And one of the best sources of live food for them are termites and, and eggs. This is what they rely on in the wild in order to raise those chicks. Now in captivity, this is something that can be very difficult to do. Now I've done this in the past where I go out and I collect termites and eggs to feed them. And some of the best years that I've had have been those when I do something like this. But these are sources that are not really reliable. They're hard to obtain. You can't just find this online and order. So you literally have to go out and get it. And depending on where you live, you may have a harder time. Here in Florida, it may be a little bit easier to find some termites during certain times of the year, but up north when it gets cold, that's not gonna be a possibility. So this is something that is a little bit unsustainable, but there are other methods. You have other sources of live food that you can offer, like mealworms and wingless fruit flies. But what if you don't wanna mess with live food? Maybe you keep your birds indoors and you don't wanna to have to deal with any of these small bugs. Well, there are other things like, for example, breeding powders, egg food, sprouted seeds, green seeds. Um, there's a variety of different things, even freeze-dried insects that you can purchase, like for example, shrimps, mealworms, crickets, and bloodworms. These are all alternatives that will help you bring these birds into breeding condition. Same as with the live food. Now, it may take them a little bit more time to get accustomed to something like this, but with consistency and a little bit of patience, it is something that they eventually take to and it does help them get into that breeding condition. Tip number three, establish a breeding program and set goals for yourself. When you do this breeding program, do you plan on breeding in cages, flights, or aviaries? Now I know what you guys may be asking yourself or wondering, is that it? Was the speech over? No, the speech was not over. Unfortunately, we were having technical difficulties, not only with the camera, during that speech, but this is actually the second time that I sit here and try to re-record this. So what happened during that speech was, unfortunately, my camera stopped working because it was shooting in 4K instead of, four, uh, instead of 1080p. That was a mistake on my behalf. The video was way too long and it had a hard time getting the video plus the audio, so it shut off. Then I tried to re-record it here in the bird room for you guys so we could finish the second half of that speech and I didn't connect the aux cable correctly, so it was only video, no audio. So here we are again for a third time trying to finish this speech. I have never had such a headache in my life trying to post a video for you guys. So I really hope that you guys enjoy this one. I hope that you appreciate the video because it has been a pain to get it uploaded and get it finished. Now we left off on tip number three, which was establish a breeding program and set goals for yourself. Will you breed in flights? cages, or aviaries. And this is a topic that many struggle with when they first get into the hobby because they don't know which way to go. And there are many factors that you have to take into account prior to jumping into this. One of them, or one of the biggest factors is the climate. Where do you live? Is it gonna be cold during the winter? If it's gonna be cold, then an outdoor aviary may not be as suitable for you. Do you plan on bringing the birds in during the winter and so on? So take all these things into consideration prior to deciding these things. As a general rule of thumb, here in the US, the majority of the breeding that we do are or is in cages. In Europe, the breeding that they do usually is in cabinet style cages, which is something similar to ours, but the cages are not as exposed. These are made out of wood, and the majority of the times, both of the sides and the back is covered, and this offers a lot of protection and security for the species that they keep in there because they feel a bit more secure and not as exposed as with the cages that, for example, we have back here, which are open on all four sides. And then you have the Aussies. And the Australians, well, they do it completely different. They like to breed in large outdoor flights or large aviaries, but they have a perfect climate for this in many parts of Australia, and they're able to do this year round. So pick what works best for you. And despite whichever route you decide to go, realize that all three methods will work and are suitable for establishing these species. Now, don't get me wrong. Each one of these methods has its pros and has its cons. Like for example, you have to realize that when using cages, this may be a little bit more difficult for an African wildcat species to get established or to get used to a cage 
When compared to an outdoor aviary, they may start breeding quicker in an outdoor aviary versus a cage, but a cage offers a breeder complete control from beginning to end. We can see when the male starts to build the nest. We can see when the female starts to lay. If they abandon the nest, we can tell right away and take action. If they toss chicks after they hatch, we can spot it a little bit quicker than we would in an outdoor aviary. We could take action and grab that chick and save its life and so on. Uh, outdoor aviaries are not as easy. These are a little bit harder to control and you have to just be willing to let go and let nature take its course. In an outdoor aviary, if a female becomes egg bound, you may not be able to spot it in time and she may end up dying. You may also have a hen toss out or a male toss out some chicks. You're not going to spot that. Those chicks will be gone. Other species competing within that territory for space, food, and other essential stuff may cause a breeding pair to stress out and so on. So there are many factors that you cannot control in an outdoor aviary. Now, I have been fortunate enough to work with all three of these settings. As you can see, I have cages, I have the outdoor aviary, and I also have flights. And for the purpose of establishing these species in aviculture and getting their numbers up, I believe that the best method is cages or small flights. This way, you're able to have better control of what's going on. And we're at a point where the more chicks that we can put on a perch and get winged, the better off we're going to be in the future. Now, moving on, another thing that you have to focus on is will you be working with only one species or a variety of different species? And a lot of breeders that start in this hobby struggle with this because they feel the need to save all of them at once. And what they end up doing is that they get one pair of each species and they get 20, 30 different species, give or take, let's say for example, and only one pair of each species. This is the biggest mistake that you can make because unfortunately with only one pair of each species, you cannot advance anything. It's going to be difficult for you to focus on the needs of so many different species and help so many of them out. And more often than not, many of them will fail. And what's going to happen is when you do have those few that do succeed, you can't continue the bloodlines. You can't advance it forward. What are you going to do? You just hatch chicks from one pair. There's nowhere else to go from here. Now, moving on to tip number four, which is the more pairs you have, the higher your success rate. And when I say the more pairs, I'm referring to pairs of the same species. One of the biggest problems that we have with African wildcats is that the age is unknown. And that is true for any type of wildcat bird. You will never know the age. Another problem that we have with finches is that unfortunately they don't have a really long breeding cycle. So this is a big issue for us. The more pairs you're able to acquire of these birds, the higher your success rate. Because all of these pairs are going to be completely different. I've had pairs, like I've mentioned before, that straight out of quarantine, they start to build the nest and they start to breed, while other pairs may take a year and not do anything. So if you have, for example, red cheek cordon blues and you have five pairs, most probably you may have two or three of those pairs breed successfully for you while the other two don't do anything. But if you only decide to get one or two pairs and you end up getting the two that will not do anything, then you're stuck. So the more pairs that you can get of a certain species, the higher your success at breeding those species. That is one of the reasons why personally, I like to get between four to 10 pairs of every species I keep. Anything that you see in this aviary, there's between four to 10 pairs. One, so that I could have plenty of bloodlines, and two, so that I can optimize my success with those birds. Moving on to tip number five, be patient. And I know this is difficult. It's difficult for you to be patient, especially after I just told you that one, the age of these birds is unknown, and two, their breeding cycle is pretty short. So I'm telling you now, be patient. I know it's difficult, but you have to be patient with these species. And what do I mean by this when I say be patient? Well, I've seen so many different types of breeders who buy pairs of birds. They set them up to breed. They don't do anything during the first season and they give up. They sell them off to somebody else. Guys, you have to be patient with your birds. These birds are wild. These birds, it takes them some time to get used to cages. It may take them some time to get used to the settings that you have in your bird room or the diet that you are offering them. So be patient with them and you will be rewarded. And I've seen this time and time again where breeder sells the bird after a year of not doing anything. And then the person who ends up getting those birds has success that following season. So just remember, be patient with what you have. 
And not only with being patient as far as giving the birds time to settle and do what they need to do, but be patient with yourself. Learn what you're capable of as a breeder. Learn where your expertise level lies. You can't run if you don't know how to crawl. And what I mean by this is start off with species that are easier to breed, species that are at your level. If you're a beginner, don't go for the greenback twin spots. Don't go for the Dybowski twin spots. Let expert breeders work with those and figure out a way how to advance those while you work your way up to that species. Start off with a species that's a little bit easier. For example, the red-billed firefinch. Those birds are very willing to breed in captivity. They're willing to breed in cage settings. They're willing to feed their own chicks. They're a great beginner species to learn the ways on how to continue moving upwards in this field. Now, tip number six is use society finches as foster parents. And this is probably the most debatable topic amongst the finch world. I've never seen a group of people get more divided than when the topic of fostering comes up. It is the equivalent of a political debate between the left and the right amongst finch keepers. And many of them are going off of old books or quotes from people that they've heard in the past, people who may have not necessarily done this or fostered or done anything like this. And usually it's one or two things. One, the society finches will imprint on the species that is being fostered, and then it's not gonna wanna mix or breed with one of its own. Or two, that little by little, these birds lose the ability to be good parents or to be successful at hatching their own because they were raised by societies. And I can tell you from experience, None of this is true. I have used societies countless times over the years in order to advance a variety of different African species going on to fourth and fifth generations. So as you can see, society finches are a great tool, a tool that we can use in order to advance this hobby, a tool that we desperately need in moments like this where these birds are hard to come by and we have limited stock. Every single one of these chicks that we can hatch and save is going to make a difference in whether we can save that species or not. Society finches are worth their weight in gold at the end of the day, and it is up to us, the breeders, to learn how to use them and learn how to improve with them. And this is something that the Europeans know very well because they've done it in the past. They've done it with countless species, but we're only going to name one species, the Gouldian finch. Many of you guys know the Gouldian finch, but do you know the history of the Gouldian finch? Well, they're saying that as early as the 1930s, the Japanese were exporting Gouldians to make a profit. They were grabbing them from Australia, they were exporting them not only to Japan, but little by little they started to make their way around the world, and one of the first places that they landed was Europe. Now, the Europeans started to work with these birds little by little and started progressing with them. Now, by the 60s, the Gouldian made it to the U.S. And the 60s was a very delicate year because this was also the time when Australia shut off its doors to export in order to protect their wildlife. So what happens now? We have a high demand for a beautiful species in the U.S., but there's no more supply because Australia completely shuts off export. So what happens? Europe starts to breed them by the hundreds of thousands with the help of the society finches. And during the 70s and 80s, Europe becomes the number one supplier for the United States in Gouldians. As you can see, thanks to fostering, the Gouldian finch is now a species that is widely available outside of its native land. And I believe that we can achieve the same if we use the societies in order to foster some of these harder to breed African species. See, the problem that we're having is that most of these wildcats are willing to breed. They're willing to build a nest, they're willing to lay eggs, but when it comes time to incubate, when it comes time to feed those chicks after they hatch, that's where many of them struggle and fail. And I see posts commonly online all the time on Facebook with people saying, for example, my red cheek cordon blues tossed again. If you don't have society finches ready, when you have these African finches on eggs, you're wasting time because it's only a matter of time. All it takes is one little mistake. And all it takes is maybe you didn't feed live food. Maybe you didn't give them the right amount of food or soft food or whatever it is that they needed. And they toss those chicks and you don't have a pair of societies ready to put those chicks under them and you're losing potential chicks. Now that's not to say that everything with societies will be fine because that's not true. 
anything can go wrong. There are plenty of scenarios that you have to prepare for with Society Finches because even though they are a tool that can help us advance this hobby, they also cause a lot of frustrations. But luckily, if done correctly, you can improve your breeding by two to three times the amount that you would naturally be able to do if you were just doing it with the parents alone. Tip number seven, don't sell your hard work. And this is something that I see so many people do in this hobby. Not only with the finches, but with a variety of other species, whether it's parrots, game birds, or whatever it is, they get into the hobby, they buy all the pairs that they want in order to uh, start their breeding, and they make the very simple mistake after having a very successful breeding season, and that is they sell off the chicks that they hatched that year. And why is that a mistake? Well, that's a mistake because you need to figure out a way how to incorporate these chicks into your breeding cycle or into your following breeding season. This is why it's so important to make sure that you have a breeding program and you figure out or learn how to incorporate new chicks into your breeding program because once you sell off these offsprings that you've hatched that year thinking that maybe the following year you have the original pairs, they'll breed again, big mistake. Those pairs may not do anything for you the following season. Remember what we said earlier, the age of these birds, the age of these wild caught birds is unknown. They may produce very well one year, but the following year may not be good for you. A hen may become egg bound, a male may become unfertile, and so on. So try to keep as much as you can and do not sell your hard work. Keep it to continue advancing those bloodlines. Moving on to tip number eight, we have sell to the right people. Now you finally establish the bloodline. You finally have enough chicks for your following year to continue your breeding program. And you have spares, what can you do? Well, you can sell to the right people. Now before we get into this one, I completely understand that the market sometimes for some of these birds is not very big. And to a certain point, if you've invested X amount of money and you need to make that money back, it's totally understandable that you're gonna have to sell to whoever comes. But if possible, if there is a high demand for that species in the market, try to sell to the right people. Sell to those who are working with that species. Sell to those that have the experience to advance that species. The last thing that you want is all of your hard work going to waste. Or remember that you alone can't establish a species. You need the help of other breeders in order to successfully continue advancing these species. So you do nothing by advancing in your own aviary and establishing a species and then selling to someone who is unable to and loses these birds later down the line. Your hard work has gone to waste. So try to figure out a way to find people who are within the same expertise level as you who already have that species. Maybe you want to swap bloodlines with them, et cetera, and so on. Or maybe they want to buy a couple of pairs to start working with that bloodline and they have the right setting for that species that is required to continue advancing it. Now, going on to the end, guys, I wish I could stand here and let you guys know what's going to happen in the future, but I can't. I don't have a crystal ball. I have no way of knowing what the future holds for us. What I can tell you is that it doesn't look good. We've already seen the past. We've seen some of these patterns leading up to the present, and we've seen history repeat itself time and time again. Are we going to have imports come back in? Is the situation going to get better? I have no way of knowing. But what I can tell you is that we have to try to focus on what we do have right now. The here and the now is the only thing that we can control. We've studied the past. We've seen these patterns. Now let's try to improve the present so that we can continue advancing these species in aviculture. Between import regulations from the U.S., bird flu outbreaks, self-imposed regulations within Africa, and the decline of importers, the future is completely uncertain. I was told by a very uh, good friend of mine a while back when I was talking to him that there once was a time here in the U.S. where we had close to 40 quarantine facilities all spread out throughout the country. We had them in L.A., San Francisco. We had them in Chicago, Houston, Miami, New York. Nowadays, we are currently down to three quarantine facilities. We have one in L.A., and we have two in Florida. We've seen the decline. It's obvious over the years, as the years continue to pass, there is a decline, not only in breeders, not only in people showing interest in the hobby, but also in importers, the people who are bringing these birds in for us. We're down to three, so what's gonna happen? It's gonna be something that, unfortunately, only time will tell. 
The hobby overall is declining every single year and with less people interested as the years pass on and bird keepers continue to get older with each generation, who are they gonna pass this art down to? The time to act is now and I encourage each and every single one of you to share your wealth. And no, I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about your knowledge. If you think in terms of years, plant a seed. If you think in terms of 10 years, plant a tree. If you think in terms of 100 years, teach the people. If we don't share what we know now, if we don't teach or educate the next generation how to be successful, we will lose the art of aviculture along with some of the species we now fight so hard to establish. All right, guys, and that was the end of the speech. After that was finished, um, I had a couple of questions from the audience. They asked me a couple of things, but we're not going to go into that. This has already been a very long video. If you stuck all the way to the end, I hope that you've enjoyed it. Hopefully it has helped you out um, getting motivated, whether it's the species that you're working with or whether it's you're going to be getting into a completely different species. Now to all of my friends and everyone that I was able to meet at the ASA meeting, I am so happy. I'm truly honored that I was able to go there and uh, speak with you guys and meet so many of the people that I get to see here on Facebook. I'm not going to start mentioning names because I will forget someone and I don't want anyone to get angry at me, but it was awesome to be able to spend some time with you guys. I'm deeply sad though that I was only there on Saturday. I wish I could have taken more time off and spend it, you know, since Thursday, Friday, Saturday, every single day there with you guys and gotten to know you a little bit better. But for the short time that we were able to spend together, I was definitely very excited and learned a lot from the other speeches that I saw. So for all who have stuck this far, thank you so much. If you've enjoyed the video, remember to hit a thumbs up, like, and subscribe. And like always, we will see each other in the next one. Bye.